book, we're going to start by singing together. Turn over, if you will, to 441. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me. Sunlight, and plenty of that out there, isn't it? And I uh, hope you got some in here too, amen? And uh, glad you're here this evening. Let's stand together. Well, take your Bible tonight. Go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, another study on what we ought to be. Uh, what manner of persons ought we to be? And uh, tonight, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I think it's, it's just amazing how the Lord works things out. This is what was already planned. I had announced it on Sunday, and I did not know till yesterday that the Overtons were going to be here. And uh, I, I think they're the epitome of be of good cheer. And uh, you, you get to see that in action this evening. That was a blessing. And uh, Matthew chapter 9, notice with me, verse number 1, he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled, and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Father, we bow before you now this evening, and Lord, thank you so much already for the wonderful service we're enjoying. Thank you for the wonderful testimonies from our missionaries. Thank you for the good testimonies from the ladies from the RU conference and what you did in our hearts there. Uh, Lord, we're now bowing before you as we open up your word. Well, thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, that we have copies in our hands tonight, and I pray that this evening we would receive it not as the words of men or the words of a man, but as the, it is in truth the words of God. May they be effectual in each one of us. May we mix what we hear tonight with faith, that it would be profitable unto us. And so, Lord, open our understanding as we look at these commands that you gave about be of good cheer. And I pray you'd guide us and lead us through our study this evening. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Someone said that you can stand on a street corner in America and look at the faces of people and you realize that most Americans are not very happy. At least if they are, they haven't notified their face that they're happy. And I, I hope that's not true among folks that are Christians or folks that name the name of Christ, but oftentimes we can go around with a pretty sour look ourselves. You know, a lot of times people are not happy in the service of the king and not happy serving God. Billy Sunday, I think, used to say, you don't have to look like you fell out of the back end of the hearse to, to be a Christian. And uh, he's got a point there. Uh, how good of an advertisement am I for Jesus Christ? You know, uh, just sometimes a, a smile, sometimes just a... A, a, a friendly look is a great encouragement to somebody. And can I say, everybody needs encouragement. Everybody needs uh, to be uplifted. Uh, I'm told that Abraham Lincoln carried a newspaper clipping with him, that he always kept it on his person. Do you know what the newspaper clipping said? It was an article that noted him as a great leader. And he carried that with him so he could read that. Why? That was an encouragement to him that, that somebody thought he was a great leader. Will Rogers said this, we can't all be heroes because somebody has to sit on the curb and clap as they go by. And, uh, you know, we, we enjoy that. Everybody needs encouragement. I like the little boy who said to his dad, he said, Dad, he said, let's play darts. I'll throw and you say wonderful. Okay? That's encouragement that's being cheerful now when the bible says be of good cheer cheer means this to dispel gloom sorrow silence or apathy it means to cause to rejoice it means to gladden 
to make cheerful. It has to do with the, in, in its original word, it has to do with your expression. And it has to do with not only your expression, but it has to do with face. So it has to do with the expression on your face. Okay? And so uh, if there's joy in our heart, and there ought to be, because Christ dwells in our heart by faith, then it ought to show on our face. And people ought to see that there's a joy there and there's some cheer there. Now, there's three specific times in the New Testament that Jesus used the words, be of good cheer. And that's what we're going to look at this evening, all right? The first case is here in Matthew chapter 9. And this, we can be of good cheer because of forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin. He, this is the, the, the man, this is the account that in Mark you find there were four men that brought this paralyzed man, the palsy is paralysis, and he brought this man to Jesus. And in Mark, you read how these four men couldn't get into the house because the crowd was so big, so they got up on the roof and they broke it up and they let the guy down through. That's why here in Matthew as well, as in Mark, it says Jesus seeing their faith. He didn't just see the sick of the palsy's faith, but he saw the other men's faith as well. And he said, be of good cheer. Notice what he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. And there's not any one of us here that has not sinned. All of us are, would be under the condemnation of God. I, I, I don't agree, listen, I don't agree with the statement that God doesn't send anyone to hell. He does. And He absolutely is just in doing so. Because we're guilty. And men that reject Christ's payment for their sin and reject the only remedy for sin there is, they will have to be, they'll stand before the judge and they will be sentenced to a Christless eternity in hell, suffering for their sin. You don't, you wouldn't say a judge is unjust because he sentenced a guilty criminal to prison because he's guilty. He deserves to go there. And so sometimes we get a little uh, scared about that. But God is just, and listen, we would all deserve that. But here's the great news. Because of what Christ has done on the cross, and my receiving Him as my Savior, when you received Him as your Savior, your sins were forgiven. Hey, we, we talked about it Sunday. Past, present, and future. All of your sins are forgiven. And now if that doesn't change the expression on your face, that surely ought to. I mean, that, that's something we have that that average person on the street, they don't have. They're still, they're still under the load of their sin. And we're not under that load. Be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. There are several things that sometimes the world thinks will take care of their sins, but they don't. Time will not forgive a man's sins. Time will not forgive a man's sins. Oh, somebody says from this day forward, uh, you, you, don't, you don't go back into your old ways. or uh, you, This day forward, you clean your life up and you live good from here on and, and uh, everything will be all right. But that's okay. If you, didn't, if, I didn't, if you didn't sin anymore from the day on, what about the sins you committed up till today? What do you do with the past sins? What happens to those? The Old Testament says in Ecclesiastes, God requires that which is past. So I know that uh, time doesn't just forgive sin. Uh, time, sometimes we think that if I just let enough time pass, then everybody will forget about it. But that, that doesn't forgive your sin. When you read Genesis 49 and Jacob is talking to his sons as he's preparing to die, and, and you don't have to turn there, you, you mark that down, Genesis 49, he reminds Reuben of a sin that Reuben committed 40 years ago. And Jacob still remembered it. Doesn't matter who you are, time will not permit, time will not forgive your sin. And people will remember it. It's in, and, and now listen, when God forgives, God doesn't remember it. Your sins, your iniquities, will I remember no more? God doesn't forget your sins. God never forgets anything. We're forgetful, God isn't. God doesn't say you'll forget them. He says, I will not remember them. He chooses not to remember. It's a, it's a conscious decision on His part. And by the way, when we forgive others, if we forgive even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us, 
then we're choosing not to remember their sin against, against us anymore. Say, yeah, I forgave them, but I still remember what they did. Well, then you didn't forgive like God forgave you. So you don't hold that against them anymore. And it's not that I can't forget it. No, you must choose not to remember it. Okay? So your sins are forgiven. Life, life does not forgive. Life does not forgive. One, one man who was, uh, uh, said this, he said, Oh, that I could live my life over again. Oh, that I could just go back and relive my life. I'd do some things differently. But you can't, can you? Nobody can go back and live life over again. Life doesn't forgive. Opportunity doesn't forgive. Opportunity knocks but once, as they say. Opportunity doesn't forgive. The, you know what? <laughs> your, your body doesn't forgive. Sins that... You committed from the past, you still pay consequences for today. Sometimes you still carry scars today from sins from the past. Society doesn't always forgive. I read this week where W.A. Criswell, who was a longtime pastor in Texas and Dallas area, said one of the most poignant things he ever looked on in his life was a penitentiary, a penitentiary where uh, the, the, life, the men where life sentences were kept. They were condemned to incarceration all the days of their lives. He said they were all white-headed men sitting at machines making overalls. And the rest of the days of their lives would be spent paying a debt to society that never forgives. Wow. Aren't you glad God forgives our sins? Aren't you glad though society may not and time may not and opportunity may not and life may not? God forgives your sins. And he takes them away from you and me. Wow. Be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, sin we know. 1 John 3 and verse 4. Sin is a transgression of the law. Transgressing God's law. That's, that's our relationship to the law of God. We can, by the way, even though we're not Jew, we're, we're Gentile, we're still going to be judged by that law. Sin is a transgression of the law. And the moral law still applies to you and me. God didn't do away with that. And so we would be guilty. In fact, he said, if we just offend in one point of the law, we're guilty of all of it. That's an impossible standard to keep. And so we'd all be sinners in the sight of God. Uh, there's a song that we sing often here. It was written by William Newell. And... It was really his testimony that he wrote down as a poem. And it was a friend of his, Daniel Towner, that set it to music. You know it as at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. And he goes on to say, mercy, there was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. Where? At Calvary, when Christ died for his sins. In the second stanza he says, by God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned. To Calvary. Listen. What, that's where you get pardon for sin. You get pardon from sin at Calvary. You get pardon from sin where Christ became sin for us when he knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Oh, I don't know about you, but that ought to make you cheerful. That ought to say, man, thank God my sins are forgiven. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but... He washed it white as snow. A songwriter wrote, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. He said, The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, and His blood availed for me. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the cheer that my sins are forgiven. Amen? Now, I want you to look at Mark chapter 6. Would you look there with me, please? Mark chapter 6. Notice with me verse 45. Mark 6, verse number 45. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed them by, or passed by them. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, What church? Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship and the wind ceased and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. Here's the Second time Jesus said, be of good cheer, and it's the cheer because of his presence, the presence of Christ. This is, a, this is a tremendous picture of the weakness and the helplessness of humanity. It's nighttime. It's really in the wee hours of the morning now, and they're, they're toiling and rowing. The winds are contrary. It's, it's sort of stormy on the Sea of Galilee. They're not getting where they thought they were going to go. They should have been to the other side by now, but because of the contrariness of the winds, they weren't, they weren't at their destination. And, and, and if that wasn't struggle enough, if that wasn't frustrating enough, they see somebody walking on the water. And, and it's interesting that he's very careful to tell us they all saw him. I mean, if just one or two guys would have seen him, they'd have said, did you see that? And the other guys would have said, I didn't see nothing. I didn't see nothing. Got it? And, uh, but they all saw him. And they thought it was a spirit. They thought it was a ghost. And, and, and so they cried out. They, they didn't cry out for help. They cried out. They were scared. And, and, and Jesus is there. And, and, I mean, as helpless as they were, as terrified as they were, it, it shows... It shows this, the common characteristic of all humanity. You know what it is? Humanity is afraid. Humanity is afraid. I'm told in Africa that natives will worship in a devil house. An evil worship the devil or the evil spirit. It's always in the front of the compound. Other places they build porcelain temples to try to drive away evil spirits. In the Orient, the houses have the roof upward and slanted to kind of, they're trying to, it's to ward off evil spirits from coming into their home. You see, existentialism, which is basically saying man's alone in the universe. There's no purpose, right? We're just here, and and when you're done, you're, you're done. You know what that means? That means it's awful lonely place. That's, by the way, that's the danger of evolution. If there's, listen, if there's no God, then I'm here all by myself. So are you. So are you. You know, it's a, it's a fearful thing to be all alone. It's a fearful thing to be all alone. And man is alone and afraid. That's sort of the, the, the philosophy of modern civilization. That's why that Jesus said in the end days, and the Bible says in the last days, They'll cry two words, peace and safety. We're seeing so much done in our world because of safety. Because why do people want to be safe? Because they're afraid. They're afraid. The, The fear, the fear of man brings a snare. But here's the Lord coming to them. And what's great is they're crying out. They're terrified. They're afraid. They're frustrated, I'm sure. And immediately, the Bible says in verse 50, he talked with them. And what did he say? He said, be of good cheer. 
It's I. Be not afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Hey, as long as Jesus Christ was there, they had nothing to be afraid of. But wait a minute. Where's Jesus Christ now? Wait a minute. Colossians says He dwells in our heart by faith. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So Christ is with us. He's with me. He's never, lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. He said, I'm never going to leave you. I'm always with you. And so if Christ is with me, I have absolutely nothing to be afraid of. You have absolutely nothing to be afraid of. In fact, David said, it doesn't matter if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't fear any evil. Why? For thou art with me. I can go through the valley of death. I don't fear. Somebody says, well, I kind of get, I'm afraid of dying. Well, you've got to focus on, you're, you're focusing on death instead of focusing on who's with you when you go through death. Focus on Jesus. Disciples out on that storm-tossed sea and getting to the fourth watch of the night, which is between 3 and 6 a.m. But you've got to remember, who, put the, who sent them in the boat to go to the other side? Jesus did. He sent them there. And then, if Jesus sends you, you needn't be afraid of any opposition. If Jesus sends you to the Congo, you needn't be afraid of any opposition. If Jesus sends you to India, you needn't be afraid of any opposition. As long as Jesus sent you. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. When things looked the darkest, Jesus came walking on the water and told them to be of good cheer. Mm. I think if you're going through a rough time, if you're going through a storm in your life right now, and you're a little fearful about what, what, what's going to happen, am I going to get through it, and what's on the other side, I, I encourage you, don't look at the storm. Look for Jesus in the storm and trust Him. Hear Him saying to you, it is I. Be not afraid. There's never any disappointment in Jesus. He promises His presence. He promises His pardon. He promises His provision. He promises His peace. He promises His power. All of that comes from Christ. He does all things well. David Livingston, the great missionary to Africa, was asked to address the students at Cambridge University. In a very simple and quiet voice, he said to them, Gentlemen, Shall I tell you what it was that kept me true to my resolve through all those years in the dark continent? It was the words of a gentleman. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. David Livingston. Will you rest upon that word as well? Will you be of good cheer? Will you fear not because it is Jesus? He whispers that to you and he whispers that to me. Accept it. Accept it. He has not given us the spirit of fear. We need not be afraid for he is with us. Andrew Murray was a great man of faith and he said we need women, men and women of faith in our day. Those who will trust in God's word regardless of the circumstances and who will obey God's word regardless of the consequences. Trust God's Word regardless of the circumstances and obey God's Word regardless of the consequences. How many times do you hear people say, yeah, but if I do that, you know, this will happen. Well, you're worrying about the consequences. Well, all you need to be concerned about is the obedience. Trust God. Just believe God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And so trust God. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Okay? Be of good cheer, the presence of Jesus Christ. So we have to be of good cheer. We have forgiveness of sins. Be of good cheer because of the presence of Christ. There's a third time Jesus says it. It's in John 16. John chapter 16. Would you turn there, please? John chapter 16. Are you doing okay? All right. Are you of good cheer? 
Your face doesn't look like it. I'm disappointed. <laughs> All right, John 16. John 16. Look at the very last verse of John 16, the very last verse of the chapter, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The last cheer is to cheer because of our victory over the world. Now this is an amazing statement made by Jesus Christ. I have overcome the world. Now listen, had Napoleon said that, you would understand that. Had Alexander the Great said that, you would have understood that. Had, had uh, Augustus Caesar said that, you might have understood that in the Roman Empire. But here's a despised Nazarene dressed in peasant's garb. No place to lay his head. No worldly glory. No army. No credentials. Find his name. Soon to be betrayed, crucified, dying a criminal death, who looks at his followers and says, I have overcome the world. Wow. You know what's great? They believed him. They believed him. Because that, that wasn't just a despised Nazarene speaking. That was the king of glory. That was the one who created the world. He spoke the world into existence. And so he is the one that overcame the world. And, and he overcame the world, let me say this, in his life. The life of the Lord Jesus. He overcame the world. He shaped the world. We, we, we tell our time. They begin time with him. Before his day, it's before Christ. And after his day, it's Anno Domini or after Christ. Or in the year of our Lord, 2017. We still refer to time that way. He overcame the world in his life. And I'll say more about that in just a minute. Also, we know he overcame the world in his death. The end result of the world is always death. We sang Sunday, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. <coughs> <coughs> so he conquers by rising. You know, there's a song, it's in our hymn book as well. It's called, Just When I Need Him Most. Listen to the first stanza of this song. Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear. Ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need him most. And in the chorus he says this, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when we need him most. See? Victory. Now notice what he said. Now, to have victory, you have to have a battle. Understand? There's got to be an enemy. There's got to be an opposition. If you're going to win a game, there's got to be somebody you're playing against. Okay? And, and so we, we have an enemy. We have an enemy. The, we have three enemies, really. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three enemies. But Jesus said, you can overcome them, and I've overcome them. But notice he said, in the world, you're going to have something. What are you going to have? Tribulation. Tribulation is a word we would use for trouble. Anybody have trouble in this world? Huh? Anybody not have trouble in this world? Well, it, it's, it's a fact. We will have trouble in this world. Charles Spurgeon said this, My Lord's words are true as to the tribulation, and I have my share of it beyond all doubt. He says, How can I look to be at home in the enemy's country, joyful while in exile, or comfortable in a wilderness? This is not my rest. This is the place of the furnace and the forge and the hammer. My experience tallies with my Lord's words. But I know how He bids me be of good cheer. Alas, I am far too apt to be downcast. My spirit sinks 
when I'm sorely tried. But I must not give way to this feeling. When my Lord bids me cheer up, I must not dare to be cast down. Boy, that's good. And what argument does He use to encourage us when we're cast down, when we're facing tribulation, when we're facing trouble? You know what it is? I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. And his battle was much more severe than yours or mine. Hebrews tells us, you haven't resisted yet to the point of blood. I don't think any of this room has. But Jesus did. He knows all about the struggles. He's the only one that, he's the only one that ever overcame every temptation he faced. Sometimes we, we just kind of blow past that. That he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. But that is such a vital truth. Not only so he could be the perfect sacrifice for our sins, but that in his life he lives through us. Galatians 2.20 He lives in us, he lives through us. And that victory, that perfect record, that undefeated Savior is in us. And therefore, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. The defeats we have at the world is when we try to take on the world and we don't let Jesus take on the world. We handle it ourselves. Man, when, when the tribulation comes, when the troubles come, don't you face them yourself? Send Jesus to answer the door. Let him take care of it. He's, he's the only one that gives you the power to overcome the tribulation of the world and the temptations of the world. If you, The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Boy, don't, don't try to do it your own. Oh, you, you may get victory one day and think, well, I've got this. Yeah, look out. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You have to rely on Christ. The don't worry, be happy crowd should be very worried and very unhappy. Because they're, they're rejecting the one who can give them the victory. It's Jesus Christ. There's a great verse over in Isaiah. Would you look there for with me? Isaiah 41. Well, I, I say there's a great verse there. There's probably many great verses there, but we'll look at one of them, all right? It's one of those things preachers say, you know, that don't make sense, but... Like when a pastor says, the honest truth is. Is there a dishonest truth? Is there? Isaiah 41. Notice verse number 6. They helped everyone his neighbor. And everyone said to his brother, be of good courage. Can I, can I tell you, I think they could have said, be of good cheer. Okay? I hope I'm not harming the Bible there. But I think he said, hey, they were encouraging each other. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith. And he that smootheth with the hammer, him that smote the anvil, saying, it is ready for soldering. And he fastened it with nails that it should not be moved. He's saying, notice the encouragement they gave to one another. The encouragement that they were giving to each other that, hey, be of good cheer. Let's do this. Again, Spurgeon said this, A man in Christ is a man upon an extraordinary vantage ground. The world cannot understand him, nor can it withstand him. He lives in it, and yet he lives above it. He glides through it, but not without trial, for in the world you'll have tribulation. But certainly he goes through without defeat, for Christ has said, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Listen. Spurgeon said, if I did not look for immortality, if I didn't look to, that heaven was the gain yet, he said, in other words, if I were expected to die like a dog, I would still wish to be a Christian. If there were no hereafter, if there were no heaven or hell, if I only had to meet the sorrows and strifes and cares and burdens of this mortal life, I would ask thee, great Master, Jesus, let me enlist beneath thy banner. 
For thou givest peace and rest to all who come beneath thy sway. That's true. If I didn't, there wasn't heaven, you'd still want to live on this earth with Jesus Christ as your Savior in your life because He gives you peace and He gives you victory over the world. The songwriter, the, the onward Christian soldiers, from victory unto victory, His army shall He lead. Hey, why is it that so many Christians, sometimes we see them so downcast and so, so, so unhappy and not smiling and there's no expression of joy on their face because instead of overcoming the world, they're being overcome by the world because it's them trying to fight the world instead of Jesus fighting the world. Yield to Christ. Ask Him for victory over the world. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So we rely on Christ. There's one more thing I want you to look at before we're done tonight. Look at Acts 27. Acts 27. Aren't you glad you have a Bible you can turn to and look at these things? I think about those dear folks that he mentioned from Myanmar and Myanmar, Myanmar. Burma, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I mean, think about that. He can't say, turn to Acts or turn to Isaiah. He says, turn to Mark. And that's what they got. They have Mark. Thank God you have a Bible tonight. Amen. Continue to pray and give so others could have one. Amen. Acts 27, you know the story here is the ship that Paul is going to Rome and they, Paul is the one who said, look at me, look here. Paul said, I, I don't think you ought to set sail. There, there's, the Lord's told me that this is not going to be a good journey. And of course, they believe the owner and the ship more than they believe Paul. After all, uh, he's just a preacher. What's he know about sailing? Hmm? Come on. And so they don't want to listen to him. And so they believe the master ship and they took off. And of course, they got a storm like they'd never seen before in their life. Eurocladon is what it's called. And uh, they were uh, very upset. The Bible says in verse 19, the third day of the storm, it says that we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was, taken, was then taken away. That's a sad statement, isn't it? All hope that we would be saved was taken away. But, I love it when God butts in, amen? But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from creed and have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to do what? To what? Be of good cheer. Paul said, hey, I want you to be of good cheer. Why, Paul? Because... There will not be the loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. Well, how do you know that, Paul? Well, there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. That wasn't, that wasn't an angel. That was the angel of God. That was Jesus Christ that came to him. And he said, here's what he said, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs? He said it again, didn't he? Be of good cheer. Why? For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Now Paul, because he's been encouraged by Christ, because he believes what Jesus has told him, now he's able to tell these other fellows, hey, you be of good cheer. I've got good news for you. It's going to be exactly as God said it's going to be. Hey, what about North Korea? Hey, what about Afghanistan? What about ISIS? What about Syria? What's going on with Russia? What's happening with China? Huh? All these, everybody's, oh, oh, they're all concerned. You know what? It's going to be exactly as God said it'll be. It's going to happen. There's no need for us to fear. No us to be afraid. We have a message to take to a world that's afraid and say, hey, be of good cheer. Because I believe God. It'll be exactly as God says it'll be. And you'll have opportunity to tell them how God says it will be, and how they can have eternal life in Jesus Christ. And then they can realize 
This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. Listen, Bible Baptist Church, be of good cheer. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you for these encouraging words from the Lord Jesus. And then later from Jesus to Paul and Paul to those on the ship. And Lord, I, I pray that tonight somebody here in the room is needed to hear those words. Remind us that we ought to have an expression on our countenance, that our countenance ought to show our joy, our cheer, because our sins are forgiven. Because we have the presence of Christ with us. We're not alone. There's no need to be afraid. We have victory over the world. We do not have to succumb to the world. We do not have to be entangled with the affairs of this world. We have one that's greater in us than anyone that's in the world. And so give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And help us to spread our cheer to others. And let them know that we believe God and trust in your word. And help us to live that way, Lord. Now help us to leave tonight living the Bible we've learned. Help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. May it change the way we live by your spirit that dwells in us. Thank you for this evening. Lord, thank you for the Overtons. Thank you for the Combes. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry and the work you're doing in them and through them. I pray that you'll continue to have your hand of blessing upon them. Thank you for the privilege that we have a part in getting the gospel to the ends of the earth. Lord, we love you. Thank you for a good midweek service. Dismiss us with your care. Make us mindful you go with us. Help us to please you in all we do. We pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, 128, if you need your book, the windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight, and um, we, we do the chorus a little different, so hang in there, okay? All right? Do you know it? Okay. <clears throat> the windows of heaven, the windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight, there's joy, joy, joy in my heart. Since Jesus made everything right, I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. Here we go. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You are dismissed. No choir practice tonight, choir. <laughs>